thank you everyone for being here. I'm, I'm so excited to have all of you here. And um, I gotta tell you, I teach public speaking and this was a really hard presentation to come up with because it felt really weighty. Like if you were gonna say one more thing in life, what would it be? Um, and so I hope you enjoy what I've put together and I welcome your feedback on it. So today we're gonna talk about creating a life you love. So my name is Dr. Mary Lee Keneal and my background is I study interpersonal relationships, one-on-one -on -one relations. And I watched several of these last lectures and some of them are very um, like intellectual. And the truth is, if I was on my deathbed, I would wanna tell you some cool things that I had learned and how I think you could live a good life. So that's what I did my presentation on. So first thing I wanna say is what my definition of growth is. So we do not grow absolutely or chronologically. We grow sometimes in one dimension and not in another unevenly. We grow partially, we're relative, we're mature in one realm and childish in another. The past, present, and future mingle and pull us backward, forward, and fix us in the present. We are made up of layers, cells, and constellations. So my life experience has been, um, when I was young, I was raised in a very religious household, and I was always told that God had a plan for me. And I heard that as like, there's this big thing I'm supposed to do, and it's my job to like figure out what it is. And um, honestly, that weighed a lot on me. Like I was like, what am I gonna do? Have I figured out the right thing? And so through the course of my life, I turned 40 this year. Uh, thank you, I love you. Thank you, oh my gosh, you're my BFF. Um, uh, but seriously, like I turned 40 this year and the thing that I really learned uh, in my life is that we are habits. We are patterns that we do over and over and over again. And at any moment, at any second, we can change those patterns. So literally today I could be like, I'm not being a professor and I could just leave and start another life. And I've done that before. Um, I went through school and got my master's in marketing and I worked for a marketing firm. And after a while, I didn't enjoy it. I quit my job and I moved to Australia for a year. So in my life, if something hasn't been going good and I've thought about it a lot and I've assessed it and I feel like it's not a good <coughs> fit for me, I tend to take change. Because if you don't do change, all that happens is you continue to do the same thing and you get older and older, okay? So, this is kind of what I based this off of. One of my first jobs was working at a senior center. And there's a book, it's called The Regrets Before Dying. And this lady was a hospice nurse. And what she did was she went around and sat with different people who were passing away and they told her about their regrets. So these are the five regrets most people have when they pass away. I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself and not the life that others expected of me. I wish I hadn't worked so much I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. And I wish that I had let myself be happier. And I was 21 when I started hearing about this because I was working with a lot of senior adults and honestly, I was seeing a lot of people pass away. And, um, and so I decided that I was gonna try to live a life where when I was on my deathbed, maybe I wouldn't have these same regrets because who better to learn from than somebody who's been there. So here's my question to you is, if time is passing and we're going to grow and age and live life either way, would you rather have a life that you des design or that happens by default? And so I hope the answer is design. That's what I've learned over the last maybe 20 years. And, um, and so I'm gonna share with you kind of some ways that I design my life to have a life that I really love. And uh, I hope that you can learn from it. All right. So our lives happen minute by minute. So the first thing that I want to do is I'm gonna hand out to you a, a tracking worksheet. And I just want you to take a look at it and I'm gonna explain how it goes. So we are only given so many hours in the day and those hours are broken down into minutes and seconds. And we don't tend to think about it, but one of the ways that I found a life that I really loved was, hopefully I have enough, was um, really stopping and thinking about what was <laughs> happening in that minute. And if in that minute I was doing something that was energizing me and making my life more um, beneficial and good, or if it was something that was dragging me down, okay? So on these sheets, basically what I want you to think about is from the time you got up this morning until now, what activities did you do? Okay, 
So not, you don't have to write them on the sheet yet, but what I want you to think about is what activities did you do? And then when you think about the activity you did, I want you to break it down further and decide if it gave you joy, if it gave you energy, or if it was something that you just had to do. So can anybody think of something they just had to do this morning? Yes, ma'am. Walk my dogs, perfect. Okay, yes? Shower. Shower? Mm -hmm. Wake up. Wake up, perfect. So all those things, you just gotta kinda do them. Did anybody do anything they really wanted to do yet this morning? Read the Bible. Read the Bible, very good. Um, work out. Work out. Mm -hmm. Went and got ashes. Very good, ashes for Ash Wednesday. Ate breakfast. Ate breakfast, very good, okay. So, here's what I want you thinking about is, the patterns that you choose that build you up, you can integrate more of those into your life, and the, the things that you don't like, you can reduce those, okay? So if you look at this worksheet, the first thing I want you thinking about is the activities that you do, okay? The second one, so it's broke out A-E-I-O-U, is your environment. Are there things in your environment that bring you life, or are there things in your environment that bring you down, okay? So, um, sir, remind me your name? David. David. You read the Bible this morning? Yes, All right, do you, read, do you read the Bible every morning? I'm trying to. You're trying to. Perfect. That's exactly what I'm getting at. So where's your Bible stay? By my bed. Perfect. So when he wakes up, he sees, first thing, something that primes him to live the life he wants to live. Okay? And so when you think about your environment, and you can do this when you go home today, is just walk in and look around you. Sometimes we don't even think about it, but there are things in our environment that make us frustrated or stressed out or clutter, things like that. Okay? The next one is, I, is interactions. So I want you to think about interactions that you've had that bring you joy and interactions you've had that don't. So can you think of an interaction that you've had today so far that brought you some happiness? And it doesn't have to be anything huge. Sir, sorry. Uh, you know, when you wake up and you look at your bunnies, <coughs> good morning, and then they just look at you with the greatest eyes in the world. That's perfect. Did you guys hear him? Mm -hmm. He said when you wake up in the morning and you look at your bunnies, he has bunny rabbits, yeah. and they just look at you with these beautiful eyes. And you laugh, but I got to tell you, does anybody have a pet? All right. Does a pet ever like give you grief? Mm -hmm. On occasion, most of the time they're happy to see you though, right? Cuddle they're cuddle buddies, okay? Um, and so that's really important. I want you to be thinking about that as the interactions. So that takes me to the next one, which is objects, okay? With objects, you can create cuddle buddy situations, okay? So the objects that are around you, they kind of determine what your life looks like. If, you're, if you want to go to the gym in the morning, you might need to put your clothes in the gym ahead of time, I mean in the car ahead of time, that kind of thing. Okay? And then the last one User. is users. What do you think that means? Okay, so it has to do with when you're in a situation and people are interacting, what do the interactions look like? So are they done via technology? Are they done face-to-face? -face? Um, are you doing a lot of listening? Are you doing a lot of speaking? So the idea being that sometimes we really enjoy, like for instance, um, I'm, I'm very nervous today, but I like public speaking because I do it all the time with my job, okay? Now, one-on-one -on -one gets a little scary for me. I'm a professor. When do you think people come to see me one-on-one? -on -one? Often. When there's a problem. That's right. So when you're coming for me one-on-one, -on -one, unless I know you and you're smiling, I'm like, oh no, it's probably going to be a problem. Okay? And so being aware of that kind of stuff can help you pick the life you want. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a, a one-minute video here that gives you an example of what that looks like in your life. Let me make sure the volume's up. Sometimes it's tough to keep your observations in order. AEIOU is a framework for making field observations oh, so quiet. And, <coughs> and it's great for capturing micro-level detail. Here's how it works. Let's say we're observing a concession stand at a football game. The activity would be ordering food. In your environment, you would write down the details of the overall space. Okay, so you can't hear it, and I apologize. But basically the idea behind this is that you can use this to track what brings you energy and what doesn't bring you energy in your life, okay? So I study human dynamics, I study people. 
So these are the needs that are fulfilled by social interaction or the fancy name fundamental interpersonal relational orientation. So when we interact with people, we're fulfilling three needs, okay? Inclusion, affection, and control. Inclusion means you're part of something. Why would it be important that you be part of something as a human? Because you have belonging needs. Because you have belonging needs, very good. And practically, do you like to be by yourself out somewhere? If you see other people around, what do you tend to do? You flock to the group, okay? So it's evolutionary. When you're by yourself, you're in danger a lot of the time. So a lot of times we try to be with other people. So we like to be included. We like affection. We like to be liked. Um, and that's really easy. When you come home and you knock on the door or you walk through the door, does the person on the other side of the door say, hey, it's so great to see you? Or are they like, uh? Nobody's there. Nobody's there, okay? So liking is that I like to see you. I enjoy being around you. You are likable. Okay, and then the last one is control, and control is that we have power over our own lives and our own choices, and that's actually what we're talking about today, is how you have the control to build the life that you want to live. Okay, so here's what that looks like in interaction. We use a symbol to assert an identity, and then it is either confirmed, disconfirmed, which is ignored, or rejected, okay? And um, let me see if I can show you an example. All right, so this is a symbol. You know what it is? Girl Scout cookies. Girl Scout cookies. Okay, how many people this brings joy to your life? Yes. Yes, okay. Just not my hips. All right, so you look at this symbol, I hold it out, and you confirm, you say thumbs up, I like Girl Scout cookies. Anybody say thumbs down? All right. Tell me your thumb, now here's okay, this is how we become good, um, good, in good relationships. Tell me why your thumbs, because you hear the judgment, yeah? Tell me why your thumbs down. I don't like sweets. Don't like sweets, perfect. Why is it important for you to know that about her as a person? So I don't waste my own bucks on her. So you don't waste? Isn't really wasting four bucks when you're gonna eat them when she doesn't eat them? That's right. Why else? Anybody else gotta know? Yes. They taste like plastic, okay. But you do like sweets. Okay, so if we were friends, I would know next time, no Girl Scout cookies, but what kind of sweets do you like? Skittles. Skittles? Perfect, perfect, okay. All right, I'm gonna give you another symbol. When you are in the bathroom and you see this. Anger. Anger. Your life is over. <laughs> what is this? Okay, I really want you to, I'm gonna push you here for a minute. This is actually cardboard, yeah? But in our culture, we all understand that this has a purpose, toilet paper roll. Why does it make you angry? Because there's nothing on it. It shouldn't be empty. What happens? What, what is supposed to happen in your mind when you see this symbol? They should, have changed. they should have changed it, okay? And now here is where I want you to understand how this works. This is the symbol. What is the identity that you associate with me if I leave this symbol in the bathroom? Lazy, Lazy inconsiderate, selfish. Ir irritation, selfish, okay? Forgetful. Forgetful. Forgetful, thank you. And forgetful is a kind way to look at it, right? <laughs> she says you forgot to do it, he says you're just a bad person, all right? <laughs> so here's, here's the thing to understand about us as humans, is that we look at something and we already feel an emotion or a decision or a story about it without really understanding what it's about, okay? And that's how we interact with people. So for instance, if I was to say, I'm gonna give this box away, who would like it, who would like it? Anybody want this box of cookies? It's empty. It's empty, right? <laughs> How did, hey, check though, watch. She didn't open it, how do you know it's empty? I felt it. You felt what, the weight, okay? So a symbol doesn't have to be something physical like the box, the lack of weight tells her it's empty, and now you are what? I don't know how to feel. Yeah. Do you feel good towards me or bad towards me? It's not really towards you, it's towards the box. The box should have been You're full. so emotionally advanced. I love it. 
<laughs> if I sold you this, you'd definitely be mad at me, right? Right. Okay. So, the feel of something is a symbol. What are these? So comfortable. So comfortable. How can you tell they're so comfortable? You haven't touched them? You haven't worn them? They look comfortable, okay? Um, are they Halloween socks? They could be. They could be. They're Christmas socks. Do they say Christmas on here anywhere? No. No, they say tis the season. So how do you know they're Christmas socks? The colors, okay? So these are all symbols that we use to create our world, all right? And it sounds funny, but I want you to think about it, that as you move through the world, when do you know Christmas is coming? You start to see these things. Have you started to see stuff out already for Easter? Uh, yeah. yeah, and Easter's not till April. We're actually technically in a season of Lent, right? Okay. So I'm gonna show you something about how we are as people. So let me back, let me back for a second. Remember I told you we use each other to get inclusion, affection, and control, and we identify what that looks like by looking at these symbols and comparing them to each other and agreeing on them together, okay? So, as humans, we always think we're very smart and that we know a lot. We don't, okay? We're very, very social animals. We're actually what's called prey animals, P-R-E-Y. Do you know what that means if you're a prey animal? Yeah, it means that we, we run away as opposed to attack on the norm. So like a lion is gonna eat a zebra, we're the zebra, okay? So this is a study that was done in the 70s and it's been repeated a whole bunch of times. And I want you to just watch the interaction and put in it any person in this room. The ash experiment is one of psychology's oldest and most popular pieces of research. A volunteer is told that he's taking part in a visual perception test. What he doesn't know is that the other participants are actors and he's the only person taking part in the real test, which is actually about group conformity. Please begin. The experiment you will be taking part in today involves the perception of line length. Your task will be simply to look at the line here on the left and indicate which of the three lines on the right is equal to it in length. So for example, if you The actors have been told to match the wrong lines. The volunteer will be monitored to see if he gives the correct answer or if he goes along with the opinion of the group and gives the wrong answer. In the first test, the correct answer is to... Uh, one. 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 Two. One. Once again, the correct answer is two. Three. 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 The ash experiment has been repeated many times, and the results have been uh, supported again and again. We will conform to the group. Again, we're very social creatures. We're very much aware of what the people around us think, uh, we want to be liked, we don't want to be seen to rock the boat, so we will go along with the group. Even if we don't believe what people are saying, we'll still go along. One. 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 Group dynamics is one of the most powerful forces in human psychology. Uh, one. one. So what happened? <laughs> what did you do the first time? He stood out. He stood for what he knew to be true based on his eyes. And then what happened the next time? He became a sheep. He ignored the logic. He ignored the logic. He ignored the logic in favor of fitting in. So remember the three things that we draw from other people. Inclusion, being part of something. Affection, being liked. And control, managing our lives. So here's something interesting about us. We will stay in relationships where we're getting two of those, but if we lose and we're only getting one, we will leave the relationship. That's kind of dangerous because you could be getting from your relationship inclusion and control, I mean, I'm sorry, inclusion and um, affection, but know you're doing something that doesn't align with your values. Make sense? And you would stay as long as the other person liked you. If they quit liking you, then you would leave. So you'll, you'll stay for two values, you won't stay for just one, okay? 
Um, so this becomes important in your life because you don't go through your life alone. You walk through your life in groups of people. So when you were born, you're raised into a family. Then you go into a school, and from the time you're really little to 18 years old, you're in a school, and they're sending you in a certain direction. Before you got here to FSCJ, did you have ideas about where you would go once you got here? What school you, I mean, what um, major you might be in and things like that? Okay, where did that come from? The advisor, very good. Family. Family. Your ideologies. Say, for example, uh, if your parents are like, based upon the past, you're probably not going to go very far if you're led to believe certain things. That's right. Or if you're pressured into believing certain things. That's right. So, if you're led by your parents. If you could hear what she said, she said, if people tell you you're not going to go very far, then you won't. And we know this to be true of really little kids. It's called self-fulfilling prophecy. If I tell you long enough that you don't belong here, that you don't have a place here, that this isn't your space, go away, you're not smart, whatever, you will perform that and you just saw this guy do it. You know what I mean? Like they said, what's the answer? And he said, I'm smart, I know the answer. And then everybody was like, no, you don't. And so he said, okay, I'll just say what everybody else does. Okay, and that actually happens a lot in middle school. In middle school, peer pressure intensifies. People will actually go down in their academic achievements to fit in among their peers, okay? So, um, if I wanna take this a step further with you, here's how it works out. If you are not, in, I mean, if you are included, then you feel like you have significance. If you aren't, then you feel ignored. And when we study human dynamics, ignoring someone is the most painful thing that you can do. And we do a lot of that in today's culture because of, the, you've heard of the term ghosting? Okay, what's ghosting? You just, you just disappear. You just disappear, right? So that you just go away. And the bad thing about ghosting is that I don't know why you left. So what do you think we do as humans when I don't know why you did something? Blame yourself and create a ton of different reasons why you left, okay? So if we don't feel included and we're ignored, the opposite of that is significance. When you're moving through your world, the more people that you can make feel significant, the farther you will get in your life because people like to feel included and liked. So if you make people feel included and liked, they will come to you in droves. If you, are, if you feel um, affection, then you believe that you're likable. If you don't feel affection, then you believe that you're rejected. The bad part about this is that is it about you as an individual or is it about the environment around you? Okay, it's, it's primarily about the environment around you, okay, but you can personalize it. So just because somebody doesn't like you, I'm gonna push you here, does it really matter if somebody doesn't like you? Okay, in the latter, the latter 20 years of my life, I have learned, and it is a very hard lesson to learn, that not everybody's gonna like you and you don't even want everybody to like you, okay? So you think you want everybody to like you, but sometimes for people to like you, you have to give up what? Yourself. Yeah, major aspects of yourself, all right? And it's not worth it. And then down here in control, so we saw the guy, did he feel competent? when he said his first answer? He kind of said it questioningly, okay? And it's embarrassing, you get humiliated if people treat you like you're not competent, okay? So, if you understand this about people, you can use it for good or for bad, all right? So I'm gonna show you another instance where this is amped up just a little bit to get you thinking about the choices you make in your life. Has anybody heard of Stanley Milgram's obedience experiments? Yes. Okay, so um, I'm gonna play the video for you, but I'm just gonna give you the background on it. The background is, is that um, in World War II, after um, the, the Nazis were so brutal, some scientists believed that there was something inherently wrong with the German people, that they allowed that to happen. And so they began to study, is it something wrong with this group of people, or is it something that can happen in any situation, okay? And so what they did was they set up an experiment, and there was a teacher and a learner, and they said, okay, we're testing out some educational theory to see how students learn. And so what we're gonna do is, teacher, you are gonna read some um, words out to the learner, 
and they are going to answer. If they answer incorrectly, the research has shown that shocking them will help them learn, so you're going to give them a shock, okay? Um, and the trick was, was that the teacher was in on it. I'm sorry, the learner was in on it. And so the learner wasn't actually being shocked, but the teacher didn't know this, okay? And so I'm going to show you what people do in this situation. A decade earlier, psychologist Stanley Milgram had also looked at how we respond to authority. In order to understand how people were induced to obey unjust regimes and participate in atrocities such as the Holocaust, he set up an experiment. Volunteers were told they were taking part in scientific research to improve memory. Would you open those and tell me which of you is which, please? Teacher. Learn. Separated by a screen, the teacher would ask the learner questions in a word game and administer an electric shock when the answer was incorrect. He was told to increase the voltage with each wrong answer. Cloud, horse, rock, house. Answer, wrong. 150 volts. Answer, horse. <coughs> Experiment. That's all. Get me out of here. Get me out of here, please. Continue, please. Go right on. I refuse to go on. Let me out. I refuse to go on. The experiment requires you continue, teacher. Please continue. Participants didn't know that the learner was really an actor, and the so-called shocks harmless. You're going to get a shock. 180 volts. Oh. I can't stand the pain. Let me out of here. Stand it. I'm not going to kill that man in there. I mean, who's going to take the responsibility if anything happens to that gentleman? And I'm responsible for anything that happens here. Continue, please. All right, next one. Slow. Walk, dance, truck, music. Two-thirds of volunteers were prepared to administer a potentially fatal electric shock when encouraged to do so by what they perceived as a legitimate authority figure. In this case, a man in a white coat. 375 volts. I think something's happened to that fall in there. I don't get no answer. He was hollering with less voltage. Can't you check in and see if he's all right, please? Milgram's findings horrified America. They showed that decent American citizens were as capable of committing acts against their conscience as the Germans had been under the Nazis. Okay. So 70, I'm sorry, 68% of people across, they've done this over and over again, will shock to the point of death all the way to the very end. Um, I find this study particularly scary because how many of you take online classes? All right. So the only difference between the online and face-to-face -face is what? There's a screen between the teacher and the learner. Yes? Okay. Um, so I think this is pretty important to think about is if I can't see you and there is a dehumanization that occurs and an authority figure is telling me to do something, 70% of the time, I'm going to do it. And here's the thing. Here's where you have to be really humble because you want to think that you wouldn't do it, but everybody <coughs> thinks that they wouldn't do it, okay? And so I want you to start to think about things like that as you're thinking about your life because we all are working in systems of authority, and it's hard to stand up against something if you think it's not right and it's not happening, okay? So thinking about what your day-to-day -day life is like, I want you to begin to think about some core values that you have. So there's this concept called symbolic convergence. And it's the idea that we together create these symbols. Okay? Um, so let me give you an example of what that might look like. Can I have a volunteer? Yes, sir. Why not? Thank you, sir. Come on up. <laughs> okay. All right. So where do I stand? You can stand right there. It's good. Okay. So... Um, do you know what throwing something is? Yes. Okay. So I would like to throw or toss this marker with you. Okay? How far? That is the real question. Okay. You, can, you do, are you, can you catch it this close? Uh, good chance. Okay. Ooh, All right. We throw it back to me. Very good. You feel pretty good? Somewhat, yes. Okay. But I kind of have no idea where this is going. And I when, like when did you learn to throw and catch? Who knows? Do you guys know? elementary school when you're really little and 
In your mind, are you thinking about every single thing that your hands are doing and stuff, or is it just kind of automated at this point? Uh, well, I have to watch it, but yeah, it's pretty automated. It's pretty automated, okay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> well, look at his body. What do you do? I walk away afterwards, but yeah. Okay, come back for a sec. Why'd you, remember what I told you about people like inclusion and liking, so how did you feel when I went like this? Uh, I mean, what am I going to do? That's the real question. Well, what did you do? What did he do behaviorally? Retreat from he retreated. Okay. Yeah, I know I feel for sure, so That's okay. okay. All right. So, we we agree this is a marker, yes? In our relationship, I just turned this into what? A weapon. Okay. So now, anytime we interact and the marker comes up, what are you going to think? See? Defensiveness, a weapon, whatever. So this is a neutral object, but you can turn it into something good or bad by the way that you treat the other person. Okay? You all right? Okay. <laughs> well, you want to throw again with me? Sure. Okay. It's like, I won't look at markers the same anymore. Right. All right, what are you thinking about while we're throwing the marker now? I mean, it's the marker. All right, what are you waiting on? I don't know. He's probably going to throw it again, but that's fine. So we've known each other less than 30 seconds here and we've already established a pattern. This is how we are as humans. It's that quick. This will forever be a pattern in us. How do I fix it? By throwing the marker. Okay, here, here's how you fix it. Um, all right, so I realized that when I told you we were gonna throw the marker that I got upset and I threw it at you really hard and I'm very sorry and I won't ever do that again. I hope that you can forgive me. Can you forgive me? Yes. Okay, and then now I have to do what? Not do what? I have to do what I said. I have to not throw it again. Let hard like that, okay? And if I can do that, we can rebuild trust. Doesn't mean it's going to happen instantly, but if I say that and then I chuck it at him, trust is really broken, okay? All right, thank you, sir. All right. So point I want you to have is that we co-create what this means. So in your life, the more intimately you know someone, the more accurately you understand their symbols. So if I saw you in the hall and I brought you some Skittles, how would you feel? I would be very happy. See? <laughs> and it's just that easy. If you can get somebody to tell you what the symbols are in their life, then you can build a life of love. So I'm just going to show you some different symbols so you can get an idea what I'm talking about. Yarn. It's yarn. This is called a warm fuzzy. I, know those. I got it at a religious retreat when I was 18, where I, I accepted God into my heart and I made a lot of really good friends. <coughs> and we made these warm fuzzies as a group. We sat around and made them and talked and stuff like that. And then when you gave away the warm fuzzy, what you did was you picked somebody and you told nice things about them and you put it on their neck and then they passed it on. So I show you this symbol because everything about this symbol is inclusive. You know what I mean? When we made it, we all sat together and built it together. It wasn't competitive. We made a whole bunch of them. The whole purpose of it is to acknowledge people and do nice things for them. And then it gives you a chance to also be able to pass it along, okay? Um, where did this come from? It came from the mind of somebody. You understand what I'm saying? Like. Somebody made this up and put it into a retreat format, and it has had lasting effects. So you can do the same thing in your house. For instance, I'm always cold, so we have tons of blankets around the house. These little blankets, less than 10 bucks. This has cats on it because I'm a cat person, but you can get them with tacos and llamas and all kinds of stuff. If you want more affection in your relationship, all you have to do is get this blanket and say, I would love to have some more affection with you. Can we sit on the couch and cuddle? And then when you see the blanket, what starts to, what starts to happen? <laughs> That's right, okay? So you are creating symbols that you build into your world. Okay, let me show you this one. This is a, a chance for, all right. All right, you're already shaking your head. <laughs> Tell me your feels about this symbol. How do you use that? I don't know how do you use that? that? That's really tricky. I just, I don't know how to do that. So, 
Okay, so she says it's a polite way of saying take care of yourself. So I'm going to push it a little bit more. I'm stuck on the why What's... being squeezed from the middle part. <laughs> okay. I don't understand how that happens. So do you, see how, do you see how much of an aversion they have? And like this is toothpaste. How many people use toothpaste? I hope everybody raises their hand. Okay, and here. No, it's just the implied connotation of handing somebody a thing of toothpaste that you're just like, oh, uh, your breath, not great. Okay, but I'm not handing it to you. So here's, here's, how, um, here's how nuanced we are as people and what I want you to pay attention to and why I want you to do that tracking later about the things in your life, the objects and the people, is that if I took this tube of toothpaste and I squished it down like this, thank you. Yes. <laughs> you have a funny look on your face. What's your funny look? It doesn't matter. Okay. So here's the trick about symbolic convergence. The symbols matter to the people that made them, okay? And so um, if, there's a lot of different things you do. You buy two different, two different tubes of toothpaste so that he can have his and you can have yours. Um, but the important thing to remember is that it's not actually about the toothpaste or where it is. It's about the way that it makes people feel and what the symbol means to them. And say, when you say it doesn't matter, think about what we get from other people, inclusion, control and affection. When you say it doesn't matter, which ones are you not meeting? Inclusion and affection, right? Because you're basically telling me, I don't care what you like, it doesn't matter, it's just toothpaste, okay? So this is something really important to think about when you're creating the life you love because the things we surround ourselves with, can be, it can be literally that subtle, happy to sad. So if you start paying really close attention to your body and how your energy feels, when I walk into this room and it makes me feel agitated, what's actually making me feel agitated? When I'm dating this person and they make me feel agitated, what's actually making me feel agitated? Because you can trade in people and not actually figure out what's making you agitated and what's going to happen. Same problem, Same new, problem new person. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and sometimes it's things that people can't control, like maybe somebody's voice annoys you, okay? But then you, at least if you know that, you get to make the decision on how important that is, all right? So what I want you to take away is that we have the power to consciously create our reality through these symbols, and the goal is to choose the best realities that are around you and create them and try to live in them. And what I mean by that is, uh, so I'm Mary Lee. I'm a professor at FSCJ. I'm also a daughter. These are my parents. They came over from Tallahassee. Thanks, Mom and Dad. Mm. I'm also a colleague. I have several colleagues here, Carrie and Sarah and a bunch of other folks. I saw Jemiah earlier. Jemiah is my student. Amy, I'm their teacher. And this is my fiance, Katie. So I am a person and I live in all of these different roles and realities. And in order to have the life you love, what you want to do is pick the best of all of those and build your life around it. So I wasn't always a teacher. I used to work at an eight to five job in corporate and I did not like being behind a desk all the time. Where do I like being? You've seen it in class? With people. With people. So I paid attention and I was like, okay, I really do not like sitting here from eight to five every day. I'm lonely, you know, it's not fulfilling me. And it doesn't mean that I just became a teacher like that, but I began, began a journey of transitioning into the life that I wanted, okay? And that's what we think college is supposed to be about, like, but college has also gotten very directional, right? Like you come in, you go straight for your degree and you get out. I would offer that you can also make lots of friendship, learn lots of new stuff, try lots of different things. Hi, Cassie. Okay, so I'm gonna hand out to you, and I'm probably not gonna have enough for everybody and I apologize, but all this is is a list of core values <laughs> And I want you to look at this list, and you can share, um, and come up with, like, what are, your top, <coughs> what are your top five values? Because the truth of the matter is, is that we only have so much time in the day, and we can't do everything that we want to do. So you, you have to make some choices. And you know your own core values. These are just some things to get you thinking. Okay? So on your core values, I just want you to, oops, I just want you to think about like the top 10. Mm-hmm. 
So if you have a list, you can circle them. If you don't have a list, you can jot down what you think. You can do your top three. And remember what I just showed you, if you look to other people to get these values, what will happen? And only you live your life. So think about your own values. Oh, no, no, sorry. I, I hit the wrong button. Yeah. I was going to show it, but I thought I'd run out of time. Mm -hmm. Why? Yeah. When you don't like people. Mm -hmm. I love psychology. Yeah. Respect. No, it's respect. Yeah. Yeah. If y'all don't pronounce it, respect. If y'all don't pronounce it, I swear to God, respect. Simple. Okay. So out of your 10, can you narrow it to three? And I know, I know that's hard. <laughs> so the reason I have you narrowing is that if you are not very narrow and very clear on what matters most to you, you will default to do what other people want you to do and would like you to do. Do you understand what I'm saying there? So we like to be liked. So when I ask for a favor, you're, you're inclined to say yes. But what I want you to be able to do is decide if that's in alignment with the life you want. Because if not, your whole life just becomes yeses for other people. Right. I heard yesterday, if, it's not, if your answer is not hell yes, then you need to say no. There you go. Just like that. Otherwise, you get tangled up in everybody else's priorities. That's right. And it's super <coughs> easy to have that happen. Anybody feel that way at their job? Like you're at your job and you have what you're supposed to do, but you end up helping a whole bunch of other people and then pretty soon you're doing all the work. Okay? So that it's hard. That's what this last 20 years took me to learn is that sometimes you have to say no to other people to give other people a chance to step up, to give yourself a chance to really blossom and focus and bloom. So saying no is not a bad thing. So when you think about your three values, what I want you to do later when you get home and you have some more time is I want you to compare what your three values are to those activities that you're doing every day and see if they're in alignment, okay? Because if the behaviors that you're doing are not in alignment with the values that you have, at the end of your life, what will you actually have done? Made regrets. You maybe have regrets, okay? Maybe not. But um, remember the idea of design versus default, okay? So here's the thing. The trouble is that we think we have time. So how can you remain in alignment? Well, these are some tips. This is what I have learned over the last 20 years. I'm going to sum it up for you in about five minutes. Um, build in time for planning. So I made you guys a copy of this, but you can actually download this. Um, on, you can download it. It's called Passion Planner for free. Once a week, so when my life gets really busy and I feel like I have no life at all, all I'm doing is like working and doing what other people want me to do, I sit down with this and the people that are important to me and we plan our week together, okay? So we write down the things we have to do like work and school and then we look at the gaps and we fill in the gaps with things like spending time together, okay? Because if you don't plan it ahead of time, when will it happen? Never. Okay? And I don't know if you can remember the regrets, but one of the regrets is that you didn't spend enough time with friends. So look at this. All this is, is literally Monday through Friday, front and back, and it's broken out by 30 minute increments. Okay? So it sounds funny, but the research shows that when you plan your week like this, you end up with more time. Why? 
Because you're not wasting time. Because you're not wasting time. And what you can do is if you have several different things going on that are in the same kind of venue and you look ahead, you can play in your travel better so that you're only going to that side of town <coughs> one time. Um, but the main idea behind this is if we're roommates and we want to hang out, and we both sit down and put our schedules and then we say, okay, when are you free? And we add that in, now that's a priority as well, okay? And so if you don't put your priorities on your time, your time will just slip by, okay? So this is one way that you can keep your values aligned. And this is kind of cool because it even tells you, like you could put your week's focus up here, what your core values are, and then kind of see if everything's in alignment with them. Um, write down your goals and display them prominently. Again, lots of research on this, and I brought you a couple of things to show. So I make a vision board every year. I started a few years back, but this was my vision board two years ago. I started a business. It's called Tri Communication, T-R-Y. And it was like the year of you, companies with heart, best in jacks, close to your heart, close to home. Um, and so I was very, very business oriented during this year. I went to a lot of business stuff, okay? Um, at the end of this year, I was exhausted, <laughs> okay? So this is this year's vision board. Just be. And it doesn't mean I'll get to just be, but last year was a really, really, really busy year and I was tired and getting burned out and I didn't want to. And so I decided to prioritize more things like relaxing and meditation and spending time with friends. Now, I'm getting fruits from that year. The Jaguars just hired me to do some communication training with them, okay? So, what I want you to understand about your life is that there will be years that are crazy busy and you do them so that later on you can have more relaxation, okay? But what you don't want is your whole life to be crazy busy and then you wake up one day and you're 70 and you're like, where'd my life go? I didn't travel, I didn't do anything I wanted to do. Okay? Use to, uh, document your experience, use photos, journals, stuff like that. So the reason, so I just wanted to show you, I take notes everywhere I go, and the reason for this is that, the reason for this is that we have something called change blindness, which means that we don't notice changes when they happen, okay? And I know that sounds funny, but if you get a chance later to look that up, look up change blindness. What it means is that we make small changes over time and eventually we get somewhere else. So two years ago, there was no business. This year, I have a big contract. The only thing that's different between two years ago and this year is a bunch of small actions. Got it? Okay. And when you document that stuff, you can look back and say, oh my gosh, look how far I've come. I had no idea what this was and now I'm doing these things. Use technology to track your behavior. There's some really cool things like um, moment and hours and stuff where you can literally track what you're doing with your day. And sometimes it's horrifying. Has anybody ever looked at like their social media use and been like, oh, I'm six hours a day on Facebook, right? Um, that's right. So you can use that stuff to get an accurate um, portrayal of what your life is like so that you can make the changes you need to, all right? Because nobody sits down at the beginning of the week and says, all right, Facebook, 12 to 6, right? <laughs> it just happens. I mean, Maybe. Facebook. <laughs> all right. Use the evidence of everything that happens to you to recalibrate your life, so remembering your core values to get back in line, and then be open to changing direction if it's not working for you. Um, if you have invested in a job or a major or something and you've been doing it for 10 years and you're miserable, that 10-year investment seems like a lot, but imagine doing it for 50 years and being miserable. So if you are not happy with where you're at, figure out why and make changes. It may not be the major. It may just be that in this particular major, you don't like this class, but you like this class, okay? So last thing I want to say is to remember to be grateful. So there's two different <coughs> mindsets. One is called abundance, and the ab abundance mindset basically says that there's plenty of everything for everyone. And scarcity mindset says there's not enough of anything, right? So we should be anxious. And so even preparing this speech, I was like, scarcity mindset, my last lecture, what could you say if you had one more? And I'm like, really, Mary Lee, like 50 years, you're good. Just say what you think sounds good. What's the difference between these two? This leads to a life of gratitude. It makes you much less stressed. There's less conflict. If there's only one cookie, 
a lot of fighting over it. If you say, there's one cookie here, but I can go down the street and get more, you have a different attitude towards it, okay? So just remember, you can change your, your life at any moment that you want. And so don't feel like, oh man, I invested in this relationship and it didn't work out, or I lost this much money on something, or whatever it may be. Yes, but there's so much more to come. And then the last thing I wanna tell you, and then give you a little something, is to give yourself permission to live. So if you remember back in the beginning, the five regrets that people had, um, I basically made a tiny permission slip because I'm big into what's called priming. It's a tiny permission slip for you to have for yourself. And it says, to create and nourish a life I love and give my, I give myself permission to live a life true to myself, to work less, to express my feelings openly, to make time for friends, and to be happy. So the four regrets that people have, this is what I hope for you, that you will do them now, okay? And then my last quote is, you cannot overestimate the, overestimate the unimportance of practically everything. And basically what that means is that life is happening and it moves on, so don't give anything in your life so much weight that you let it dominate your life, okay? So when you move through life, you just kind of take things in like this, you let go what you don't want to listen, okay? So... Thank you guys so much for being here. I hope that you will take this permission slip and hang it up on your bathroom mirror or put it in your um, wallet because we need a constant reminder to live our life. Sounds funny, but who's always telling you what to do with your life? Mom. Parents, <laughs> parents, bosses, teachers. And it's, it may seem counterintuitive, but I'm a teacher and I'm telling you I want you to do what's best for you. So if you have an assignment due in my class and you have stuff going on in your family, you make your choices. You know what I mean? And I don't mean that like you make your choices. I mean you make your choices. You gotta live with yourself at the end of the day. Okay? So it doesn't matter what I want, it's your life. Thank you all so much for being here. Okay, that's my name. Sure. There should be some extras got floating around. And I, in typical communication fashion, would love your feedback. So I have some feedback forms. And why, why is it so important to always get feedback? So you can learn and grow, that's right. So I don't wanna go home and be like, oh, I did such an exceptional job, and you guys are like, ugh. So you tell me what you thought, okay? So pass them around, give me some feedback and it'll let me know what I can improve for next time. And if you don't have one that has printing on it, if it's just a piece of paper, if you could just tell me, scale of one to five, how you thought I did, what you liked and what you didn't like, I would appreciate it. Do you guys have any questions or thoughts or anything like that while you're doing that? Hey, Paige, what yes. Can, have that tracker for the Monday? can you have the tracker? Oh yeah, yes. And the cool thing about this is, if you sit down and tell somebody you want to spend time with them, like who doesn't love you already? <laughs> Thank you. You don't have a pen? That's okay. I can get you. I can give you a pen. Is that okay? I can just tell you that it was wholesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned um, like having balance and like making sure you set like time for yourself. Yeah. Um, with getting into the workforce, do you believe it's okay to work part-time jobs? Yes, absolutely. And I'm gonna be honest with you. For my whole life, since I was, um, t since I graduated college, I've worked a full-time and a part-time position. And that was one of the reasons I got so tired, and that was also one of the reasons I started my business because I knew I could leverage my PhD better in a business than I could teaching as an adjunct. I could make more money. And so I put in the effort now so that later on I don't get burned out on teaching. So yeah, I think it's all a balance and I think part-time stuff, even part-time supplementing, just make sure your whole life isn't work. You know what I mean? Great question. Anyone else? All right, you guys are free to go. Thank you so much. I appreciate you being here.